Hello everyone, today we talk about the pattern of the Iberian military orders, appearance mostly. It's not the first time we introduce um, these topics of monastic chivalric orders, nor the Reconquista. Um, the latter, uh, as you know, not really ending uh, in uh, 1492, but more than 200 years before, um, because, say, essentially the Muslims had been subjugated um, even when remaining as autonomous polities within the Iberian Peninsula, this doesn't matter much because some of these orders survive to this day, even though they were mostly subsumed by others. Uh, this video is uh, an episode of the uh, historical military units, so it mostly takes in consideration the the appearance, the, the dress, the badges of the Iberian orders, uh, during essentially the last couple of centuries of the Middle Ages. But also in times in which we can document um, iconographically, and not that much, so there, there is a strikingly, uh, say, contained number of sources considering the importance of the Iberian military orders of these guys' uh, appearance. Um, I already made similar videos to this for the, uh, especially the the brethren of the Teutonic Order, the various uh, affiliated branches, uh, and I made videos about the Templar and uh, Hospitalier Knights uh, along the same pattern, but we really have to talk more about the monastic chivalric orders in the broader picture, because we just made some introductory episode and uh, not talk so much about them individually. And part of the reason lays in the fact that, albeit um, these were some elite forces, uh, especially the, within, uh, the pants like varied uh, in their number, in their uh, in their consistency, to, to some extent they were the, the, the reflection of the same feudal military um, elite, right, existing at the time, but uh, way more morally loaded, right, they were much more highly trained, the uh, the the brethren were just uh, conceived just to, to to sacrifice, like to have the spiritual preparation for um, self sacrifice in holy combat, to uh, a much more indoctrinated and uh, fundamental degree than the other knights. Ideally, then of course um, the history of the monastic military orders, as we have already seen, is incredibly complicated, also as far as understanding who were actually these people, how you could get in the orders, and what would be your motivations and how these orders handle themselves. And the reason why there isn't too much is that, first of all, we're looking in the broader picture uh, strictly medieval reality most of the time, at least if we were to indicate just the, the most functionally Mil uh, military functional period in these orders' histories, because of course, as you know, the orders lead to, to this day um, in 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 many cases, and of course, it was also a modern or contemporary military history. But uh, naturally, these orders were born in specific contexts, like this one of the Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula from from the Muslims. Um, by the Christian North that, as you know, lasted for centuries, uh, and that created um, militarized frontier uh, where these orders were were also located. I don't remember if here I inserted uh, the picture of the actual um, a map of yes, uh, and you will see that they are. This is towards the end. I'm looking at here right now. Um, they're concentrated. Um, in the south, right, uh, towards uh, essentially the, the in Andalusia, um, south of Toledo, and in all areas it had been essentially some, some of the hostest frontiers, and it had uh, to be garrisoned to safeguard um, the peninsula from the further uh, invasions that would occur, even as uh, late as the 14th century, we've seen it in the Battle of Sagrayas, etc., from uh, North Africa. Uh, and uh, in in the Baron Peninsula, you really have a say some. Of course, all these orders are distinctive in many ways. But uh, in the Baron Peninsula, these were many and um, territorially scattered, right, to um, an unprecedented degree. Like aside from the houses um, that, um, for 
great orders like the Templars, for example, had had, etc. You have here just properly a distribution of some islands of certain provincial dimension of territories of um, essentially equally relevant, at least in a um, to, to in relation to to one another ex existentially um, orders that, uh, as we'll see now, like had all different uh, vicissitudes but that uh, contributed to this um, militarized uh, frontier and also to the development of the same Iberian armies organization. We made some videos recently about Spanish Portuguese um, uh, armies, especially during this later uh, Middle Ages. As we've seen that the contribution of these orders was substantial to say the least. Um, it uh, was uh, integrating into that sort of mo modernizing especially at this point along the French and English influence, especially um, form of military organization, mostly having to do with single companies, uh, properly uh, uniformed and drilled. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula had remained in many ways um, a world on its own, with its own traditions, its own forms of military organization. And, and in many ways, the frontier had um, transformed the country, right? had, uh, in a sense, depopulated it and uh, rendered and difficult that um, also our level of documentation of the same uh, the, the this had been Islamic uh, uh, controlled uh, countries for for hundreds and hundreds of years and so there is um, as you know like from the Christian side we have a very specific way of say ordering knowledge and posing oneself towards the, uh, say the earthly authority there is a specific form of social organization. In Islamic world, there wasn't. And in many of these areas that, uh, by flourishing, right, and, um, you know, the, you know, being, uh, say, reinvigorated by the same Christian conquest to an extent, um, the, we, um, we don't get too much, like, evidence, um, even after the, uh, the Reconquista. And the military orders by themselves were sort of more... You know, introverted um, and in many ways sort of um, exclusive to the point that we know that really few because they knew their deal, they were efficient forces. Uh, in some ways, there, there was a lot of criticism and there were lots of um, say ecclesiastical voices, for example, against the creation of this or that order because they thought that it wasn't done rightfully, etc. So that's the incredible complication of the story in many ways. But they tended to offer this, um, first of all, lifestyle, and secondly, like the, the military um, offspring, let's say, that um, remained con contained. And so th there isn't much um, documentation about this. It was, again, mostly a spiritual path that even rejected, to an extent, the world in the moment in which you joined uh, the order. All right. So... Um, their military history is quite interesting. Often we have um, encountered the military orders, monastic military orders, in uh, because it's important to distinguish. There were lots of military orders that were not monastic. They were chivalric military orders, uh, and we tend to underestimate that incredibly because basically almost all night, uh, every night, p participated to, the, to a military order of some sort and. These were essentially the, um, the, 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 the descendants of the ancient war bands and with the historical uh, initiations and military training, a sort of individual, say, collective but still customized ethos and set of beliefs. The monastic ones had, of course, the, um, the advantage of, say, um, excluding, in a sense, the the members from the world, right? So they offered a higher degree of asceticism and spiritual training. Again, the, 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 the fanatism was absolutely necessary and effective. There was a lot in the world, also in, in other, say, religions, that was being cultivated in the same way. It was really necessary to provide this top-notch fighters that um, in, in the Reconquista really had... Um, uh, really a spearhead role as much as you see in, in the Ultramare states or you look at you know in the, the Baltic um, the Teutonic um, the ratios of, of strength like 
compared to the other fighters, etc. Like it, it's really they were really designed for that brutally efficient job. Like these were people conceived as like I don't know. In order to take down one of them, you had to take into account thirty people's loader um, uh, and the on the other side. So the uh, the the relevance also in this true frontier of Christendom and the, the sort of the, the, the metaphysical boundary that this represented liminally and in this uh, perennial struggle right of cosmic forces um, is never to be overlooked, especially as far as the uh, not just the political existence, like in, again the the vicissitudes, the the, the single histories of, of these orders that had been growing quite spontaneously especially at the beginning but also in fact the meaning of their um, symbols their their actual distinctions because of course every order here was representing a different way to the truth all right the importance is the direction but of course it was a different background different values different um, Say dedications, think about the ones to, to the same single saints, right? That had all an geography highlighting this or this other virtue, like condition that they would protect uh, specific categories, uh, and so on. So that's actually a, a universe on its own that you can't really summarize that easily. Today we do something much simpler than that. But just know that uh, they are this order is a bit of a mystery, and I think that a lot of progress um, in research could be made by, in fact, gathering uh, as much information as possible about probably the uh, the symbology of, of these um, of these orders. It, it was also quite simple. In fact, as we will understand now, we even just about the the visual side of the story, we know uh, too few, but coupling this with their actual um, histories you can come to understand a lot about those same their same background that societies that produced them why were these orders needed and in different ways in different parts of Europe uh, and beyond right so we we'll talk by the way today just about the say 14th 15th century we don't go back at the, towards the beginning so we are in a more mature um, phase in which these orders have somewhat institutionalized they had practically been born all in the 12th century right except perhaps for the order of San Jorge de Alfama that however was one of the minor ones from the, the crown of Aragon and that dated to 1201 right so to one year you are in the um, in the 13th century uh, this is not much to think so we start obviously with the most important, the most famous of all, the Order of Santiago. Uh, that was not the first, actually. Calatrava was, was older, uh, and that had originated in Leon, right? It, this was known like uh, Santiago is Saint James, Santiago de Compostela, um, and the order founded in the 12th century um, uh, honors with its name the, pa the very patron saint of Spain. In fact, St. James the Great, the order's original purpose was to safeguard pilgrims traveling along the way of St. James. Uh, so, to defend Christendom in the process, and of course, um, to drive the Islamic Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula through the Reconquista. Um, what is fascinating about these um, orders is that they, again, began in very... Um, sort of simple way like the these were truly like monastic orders born within say su superimposing themselves to the normal uh, corporations that essentially the entire medieval society was organized uh, like um, there were lots of again non-monastic um, groups doing this as well that eventually wouldn't survive because they wouldn't uh, let's say meet with the sedate you see that the, mon the monastic order has a an advantage that cannot be uh, uh, essentially passed down to heirs. It's not something inheritable, so the sovereign uh, the sovereigns would um, uh, grant special um, immunities to these uh, in order to provide with in this case also pretty fine 
military troops, but without this risking becoming, um, say, yet another dynastic house to, to curb. Like, and so the various houses, their war bands would gradually, say, bond around mostly the former and the strengthening, their, say, the, the growth in their political relevance and institutional role was explained uh, in some videos already how late medieval Spain was developing um, politically. And um, the also for, for this reason, the same monastic orders, but very powerful, were not um, in, 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 say, in interest of, at least in relative terms, to the other powers of, of the realm, uh, so, um, say, in positive and um, serve for dangers for the disaggregation of the system. And they r really had, especially in the first centuries, this great military, say, colonial garrisoning um, defensive purpose along the frontier that, as you know, um, went sort of back and forth at the point, it went dangerously for the, accompl the early um, accomplishments of the Christian monarchies. Uh, the insignia of the Order of Santiago is believed to have originated um, specifically from the Battle of Clavijo, where it is said to, um, to resemble a red cross shaped like a, a sword adorned with a fleur-de-lis on the hilt and arms. And this pattern will, uh, say, eventually be repeated in other orders well, with the minor differences. The, the point is also... Uh, difficult to distinguish that one another, but they all do have particular, like it's a different color or different arms, etc. The Knights of the Order of Santiago wore this emblem stamped on the royal standard and white cape. The cross on the royal standard featured a Mediterranean scallop in the center and at the end of each arm. The three fleur de lis um, symbolized the concept of honor without stain, which alludes to the moral virtues embodied by St. James' character. Um, the sword elements represent the chivalrous nature of St. James, who was martyred by decapitation with a sword, so obviously the red uh, signified his passion, like, um, like Christ, and the fact that, of course, these brethren would take up the same sword in the name uh, of Christ, and that's all one, it's all like the same uh, Catholic meaning, just declined in, in, in the different um, different uh, individuals, and um, the legion has it that the shape of the insignia dates back to the era of the Crusades, when knights carried small crosses with sharpened bottoms to plant in the ground, and perform daily devotions, which was a very powerful, uh, say, motivation, of course, for. Uh, Christian knights that would have literally the sword uh, and the, the cross in their hands. Um, so, what do we get from the 14th to 15th century appearance? Of, of, well, first of all, the Order of Santiago is definitely the most um, portrayed, right? It was the most important order at this point, and it had a, a great weight in um, probably in the Castilian and Leonese realm. Um, we most typically look, as we've seen, at the white habit with the red espada, a sword, replaced, um, however, by a black tunic in the early 15th century, right? And still with the espada on the chest, so you had this red um, uh, sword cross um, remaining at, uh, on the heart. Um, there are interesting, uh, as specific... Um, evidence, like a tomb effigy of 1486, showing the order's white mantle and red espada very clear, right? It seems unlikely that the mantle would have, however, been worn in battle. At least, you know, this could have created some, um, uh, some impediments. Uh, it was just, there were different, uh, context, of course, which would wear the mantle, that also in origin had been like, uh, you see, that in its simplicity, it's actually the only thing that these brethren had to protect themselves from the, you know, the 
the weather uh, in general but exactly for that of course there was um, also, also you know the entire thing was about a, a journey right an armed spiritual pilgrimage of some sort and and so the whiteness of it was of course in, in, in the candor resembling as, as we've seen that purity that uh, spirit of self-sacrifice of selflessness there is a very interesting and beautiful as famous the doncel of um, the cathedral of Siguenza in Spain the guy died in 1486 when he was 14 and it's one of the most beautiful uh, we do not know his name um, but um, the the beauty of of the tomb is just one of makes it one of the most um, famous pieces of art uh, of the of the generation right and you have in fact the entire figure in in white the sense it's just like the uh, the stone rendered like that also for the rest of the arm etc whereas the cross on the chest is red right so that is extremely meaningful uh, another uh, famous portrait um, one of the best representations in fact of the Santiago brethren dress is the one of Alvaro de Luna who was master of the order between 1445 and 1453 and the guy has actually like an, an interesting as dramatic story because he had actually been the favorite of the king John II of Castilla and he would hold uh, steam positions of uh, the steam positions of constable of Castile, as well as being grand master of the order, um, through his unwavering support for the monarch against the uh, infants of Aragon, he amassed, however, uh, such great political influence in the crown's affairs that um, his royal patronage was withdrawn. Um, to really a tragic end as he was executed uh, in Valladolid in 1453 he was beheaded there are famous uh, artistic representation of this 1453 also not just a random date the end of the hundred years war the fall of Constantinople and this portrait shows a black cassock slit at the sides under the mantle Perhaps this was worn in actual combat itself because it would render movements much um, much easier, right? Um, the guy won the Battle of Old Meadow, by the way. He would have, um, like, we can imagine in combat wearing the latest and heaviest full plate armor, like uh, the one you can see in the on Doncel Tomb. Um, this full plate armor at the time was uh, also in Spain uh, imported from Italy, usually. So called Milanese uh, armor was, I have to make a video about this soon, was essentially the most, um, was the best one, most exported at the time. Like the Lombard industries were really like the only ones, by the way, organized in that way. Um, but we can imagine also other. Mm, say pieces like French helmets for example and remember that again you know we've seen it in the videos about arms and armor often the, the Iberian Peninsula of course was historically invested by the Frank the broader Frankish Western European um, style in arms and armor in many ways like the the, the Iberians maintained their own uh, some characteristics still of their own um, local warfare such as the Hinetas some sort of lighter um, arms and armor there were difficulties at the time to have like that same level of heavy shock cavalry that Western Europe really had in that uh, stronger sense we've seen how it's not until the uh, French and English intervention in the Iberian Peninsula during the Hundred Years War that the most updated Western forms of uh, military organization were, were introduced uh, in the in the greater uh, Iberian Marquis. We can imagine individuals like Don Alvaro uh, wearing like a great bassinet, um, 
this massive form of protection which could uh, not turn on the wearer's, uh, wearer's shoulders even. Consider that, of course, the heaviest cavalry of, of the of the Baron Orders would be that kind of overwhelmingly shocking, traumatic and impacting and powerful element that was just like to be it was was um intervention had to be paved right by the other unit, but when it arrived, like usually towards the end of the battle, like, you know, smashing everything and everyone um in in between. Remember what these orders really were about. It is true that they had started sort of gentrifying a little bit compared to the most fierce primitive brutality of the early days of the Reconquista, but we're talking still like fifteenth century of Spain that is also an incredibly in fact very archaic and brutal um reality. Um in many ways, as also like you see in the same internal policy um of our being being killed by the same um, uh, Spanish more. Um and um, such armor we described sort of also just to exemplify the, the panoply of the appearance of these guys in combat um, was used in the Baron Peninsula but as we were just saying would never become so popular even among the same heavily armored knights um, mostly because of the strength of the Iberian tradition of light cavalry warfare. We're talking numbers here, not the fact that, of course, as we just said, the best Iberian knights wouldn't actually have the most updated arms and armor that we'll surely look at so from, other, from other historical military unit types. Like we, we take our time, like focus on one thing. Um step by step at a time, such as details like um, what was their, for example, uh, the general, like were they shaven? Did they wear a beard? Um, this is important because as we've seen in other videos about the dress of the, of the uh, monks, knights, um, there were pretty strict rules normally about such things. Um, in the case of the Doncel and in the portrait of the Luna, we uh, see that both men are clean-shaven. However, it's important to, uh, to observe that the brethren in the late 15th century Libro de los Caballeros de Santiago, so the book of the Knights of Santiago, are actually bearded and have even very long hair, which... Um, was not really just uh, like the norm elsewhere, um, at least regarding the hair uh, in particular. It was seen a bit as one of the most worldly thing, right, of vanity, aesthetic, like hair was historically connected with the, the virility of the man, right? It was a virtue for uh, secular knights to wear long hair. Um, as opposed to other cultures, like at the time, uh, at the time of, for example, the Mongol invasion of Europe, like the, the Germans, the Poles had this idea that the beauty was a moral virtue. Of course, was a genetic principle behind that. The Mongols instead did not really care. Like uh, the the Mongol commander of, of Lenitsa, for example, was just uh, an obese man that had properly get that required a special wagon um special car to be carried um around um things were seen differently so the idea is that there was a degree of uh, asceticism but also pen uh, penitence of sort of reflection on the worldly the insignificant of worldly condition insignificance of the worldly condition uh, to the point that, of course, like all the other knights died anyway without uh, transfiguring divinely. So um, the idea is that focusing too much on this exterior transient aspect and not the soul just only, like in a, like how to at least elevate yourself and also your own body through, through that uh, spiritual preparation was bringing to, you know, you shouldn't have this great um, care for your... Uh, exterior look we should also have like simple clothes like uniformed without too much um also customization we'll see now in fact that this concept really existed among these um the the 
the, the, the Baron military orders. However, we've seen, even among the strictest um, and sort of more, more important, uh, more organized, better documented monastic military orders that, uh, say, the, say the, the regulations on beard, hair, could vary within the same order. Like, there, there could be even exceptions. Everything depended really on, like, the master, you know, the, the other um, ancillance of the, of the hierarchy and discretion and decision. Because every, every Breton was different, right? And it was a different path that, uh, say, was to be, in fact, considered as much as we are all falling in a different way. We take all different forms, so we all have our own preferential way, our more useful, more effective way to the truth. Uh, and uh, the Iberians here maintain this, um, apparently, this, say, sense of fierceness also in look with the beard and long hair. The same Libro de los Caballeros says that the brethren of the Order of Santiago uh, had uh, their own coats of arms on their shields, which also shows um, some degree of, again, of personalization, something that was not really allowed in other orders in Europe, and so maybe some uh, lesser, um, you know, or, say, consideration for the unity of the order, or at least, um, like, the fact that these orders were seen just as a privilege for, by an elite and establishment that identified, this is very characteristic of Spain, so much within the, their conquest and the broader um, Christian effort that it, it seemed much simpler that you would that you could manifest within the same order through your own coat of art. So this goes in parallel with the hair thing. Um, it's possible that the bigger, larger Latin Germanic system, especially in previous centuries, had seen itself so like it, even the emergence of these orders as an evasion for from the tumultuous development that the West, that the Latin Germanic Europe had achieved, that they needed more, like this sense of extraneation from the actual society they stand from, and so they had to spiritually purify themselves more. There were also bigger um, systems that were also they, more successful to an extent, uh, also in terms of uh, statehood, like if you get out the Teutonic Order, etc. So it, it, there could be interesting comparisons here to be drawn with the more scattered and thus more individually oriented orders of the Reconquista. Certainly, Confer Breton at least did bear their own arms so that we are certain of this secondary aspect that was also prohibited in other, in some other orders, and we are not fully aware whether, in fact, the Breton could have their own coats of arms, just because the the Libra tells us. But uh, as you understand, we do not have, we do not know everything that we would like. By the way, it, it's important to. Um, observed that all these orders fundamentally were subsumed by others, or at least were becoming uh, dependent on others. Right? For example, Santiago is um, subsumed by the same crown of Leon, 1493, uh, which is also the year after Granada, and so as we were saying before, not really the end of the Reconquista in a conceptual sense, but an important step in the elimination, probably of the last um, polity right uh islamic polity in spain then it would take other centuries before muslims were properly expelled forcibly converted um, in spain um as well um so it's interesting how it proceeded now we talk about the order of calatrava that had uh, started in 1158 uh, in castile um it um it was one of the at this main four Spanish military orders, uh, and the first properly to be found in Castile that we know of, at least of the ones that eventually we, we can document again, because there were so many that at a certain point even disappeared. We have the the, the history of some of them, right? Uh, for example, the 
The Order of Alcalá de la Selva, founded in 1174 in the crown uh, of Aragon, uh, disappeared around the 14th century. We technically do not know what happened to it. And in this case, you understand that we lack documentation in general, so something obviously happened. But there were many. Like, they began, even the most important, like the Templars, the Hospitaliers, the Teutonic Knights, eventually we come to know them because they lived on and they succeeded in... in in developing, in affirming themselves, but originally, like there were, there was plenty of uh, of them that failed, that uh, shipwrecked, were um, subsumed by others, right? They were simply disbanded by themselves because they were not even meant to have, like necessarily, a, an eternal purpose, right? Eventually, just tradition kept on fueling itself, but um, it was an incredibly much more dynamic. Uh, picture than one we often realize. Um, the uh, on September the twenty sixth, uh, eleven sixty four, Pope Alexander the third issued a papal bull confirming the establishment of the Order of Calatrava. And while the order had wielded significant political and military influence, by the time of looking up, how its power had gradually. Um, dissipated over time. In fact, uh, Santiago had, as we've seen, surpassed it. Uh, it was not until 1838 that the order's remaining property was formally dissolved, so this one actually was not um, even making it later on. It is all a history, of course, of the uh, of the order that would be interesting to look at in detail, but we're not here for it. Again, we must really make a, a video at least for each of these orders uh, at some point. Um, the Order of Calatrava um, displayed a white habit as well. However, this was abandoned in 1397, consisting, however, a grey linen tunic with a red cross fleury on the chest. Um, so there were some adaptations essentially to the uh, civilian fashion with say I don't know you, you had this gray linen tunic uh, with a red cross that distinguished you as a member of of the order but then you could wear something else like just in the in the clothing in fact there had been also for the um, for all these orders like not just a fully uniformed um, uh, dress. Uh, the sense is that you you had to have these essentials, more or less of the same kind. Uh, it's a bit like um, that, that. There were other parts of of the of clothes, other items of clothing. It could vary. Uh, this is a bit the same concept that we have observed behind the um, say early uniformation of military dress that of course wasn't all alike um, but often consisted in just I give you some clothing um, uh, of already dyed with the, the particular one with, with a, you would have to sew your, your own cross in some, in some circumstances um, and the important is that you wear that so that everybody knows even if you wear a particular type of shoes or or trousers or whatever, uh, or other, like caps, for example, that you are still a member of that order. So you're immediately recognizable. And of course you were to, to wear this in, like basically in every circumstance, as long as you were part of the order in the first place. And uh, there was a lot of... Um, Say honor, duty, and discipline connected with this dress. That had to be a constant reminder of your vow, the fact that you didn't belong to the world as at least you did before. The purpose of monastic life was not to be alienated from the world. On the contrary, um, the point was secluding yourself partly from it to acquire a higher and in pain, in suffering, in privation, this higher uh, realization, and then going out there in the world, in this case, slaughtering Moors, uh, to show others, 
other knights as well would want um, a knight, in this case, uh, also would have been capable of. That was the, the principle, really. Uh, we have a very interesting proof of this, say, adaptation to civilian custom for the Order of Calatrava's dress. Um, from uh, the Alba Bible of the 30s of the 15th century, with uh, these manuscript illuminations depicting a Calatravan fray uh, of that date and showing, for example, black as well as grey tunics and red bonnets. Um, and in this case, uh, the, the white mantle continued to be worn. Brethren were expected to be, cl to be clean shaven in this context as well. So, as we said, every order had a specific, um, specific regulations. And as we were saying before, it's possible that some of these orders were so again, so secularly political, that um, again, being just part of a great family and part of the order meant that you could really, for example, go out there with your own coat of arms. Um, there was something perhaps also more transcendental, something uh, of the idea that the same great families were so worthy in the Reconquista struggle and the Iberian politics that they could I mean their manifestation within the same order of Santiago was Santiago was so constitu was constitutive of their same Spanishness of some sort like in this kind of ways and we have the order of Alcantara uh, also referred to as the Knights of Saint Julian it was initially um, founded in um, in Leon in 1166 and later confirmed by Pope Alexander III in 1177. Um, this order adopted a green cloth fleury shortly after 1397. The order went on with the white habit seemingly until Pope Sixtus IV, we are between 1471 and 84, gave them permission to wear clothes of whatever color they wished, which also was a way of loosening the same regulations, likely for the same reason that we were talking about before. These orders were also expressed by, like, the, what's, what's Iberian society really was about overall, the elite, the oligarchy, right? So being part of these orders were becoming uh, increasingly elite, and as these I say the individuals being part of them felt that they ought, they were also just into more secular politics and they shared, as we've seen, this sense of competition with other orders and other members that, as we've seen, it also had their own coat of arms, likely, like, was a way of sort of easing, like, even the... Um, the tension that surely existed from the within and from other elements of society saying, you know, these guys should actually maintain some higher standards. Of course, at this point, the Reconquista was largely over what we call the, the, um, say the same point, but why these orders had been created. Um, in any case, uh, just like for the old order of Calatrava, the white mantle with its badge was retained uh, and uh, that was part in fact of the uniform dress. Then we have the Order of Avids. This was uh, the Evora Avids, right, Portuguese order founded in 1176. Um, this would be eventually subsumed by, by the crown in the mid-16th uh, century. Um, Calatrava had suffered the same fate for, in Castile in 1489, and um, this the, the Order of Abbots, uh, Portuguese chivalric order, that's Green Cross mainly. We have an interesting passage by Frasar, however, telling us about a Portuguese envoy in uh, 1385 describing 
the dress of the order of abbots um, mistakenly uh, we do not know whether it was Frasar or was wrong or the actual Portuguese guy said it's more likely it was Frasar saying that the uh, the order wore white mantles with a red cross on them. Uh, I made a video about Frasar as a source. You know that he worked for the uh, for the French, um, for the English. He had uh, he was a Flemish background. So there was a lot of things going on um, in the in his in his life uh, that influenced his uh, writing. He's not an extremely precise source. He, say, shows us how like this chivalric world, like the world of the of nobility, like now running after the, uh, the 14th century crisis, the system ever more tightly. Uh, but even a great chronicler like him, the greatest French, uh, medieval French chronicler, could be imprecise, inaccurate, um, and more, but we forgive him naturally for this. Then we have essentially the Portuguese offshoot of the Order of Santiago that in Portuguese sounds like Santiago, uh, wearing a white habit with uh, a red espada, just like that of the Spanish order, except that the blade also ended in a fleur de lis. Um, and this this is fascinating because technically, like uh, they, they were a separated order, and so they changed literally also the, uh, the main symbol, a little bit. Uh, but of course, it referred to the broader like Iberian point. Like this. then we have the order. Uh, there are many actually, like other minor ones. It was the one of San Marcos de Leon, originated in eleven seventy two in Leon, but subsumed by Santiago as early as 1178-1180. We have the um, one of Monte Gaudio Santo Redentor, created in the Crown of Aragon in 1174. Um, these years are the ones of essentially the um, Almohad coming back and so the need of now a fully like Frankicized like uh, Iberia, uh, Christian Iberia, like has to strike back to these brotherhoods, right? And in 1196, this order of Monte Gaudio Santo Redentor is subsumed by the, the Templar order. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I made some... Yeah, I, if you go in the playlist, uh, say medieval, say military dress or something, there, there are some of these orders, like there is the order of Montjoie, some of the, the bearing ones that had gone over to the uh, to the Holy Land, right? So uh, now I, I don't. I will post them down below anyway. But just for saying how, of course, there was through these orders a here it is, right? The the one yes, monastic military orders inhabit as part of it: Hospital, Temple, Teoton, Saint Lazarus, Saint Thomas, uh, Montjoie, etc. Um, because of course these were orders not conceived just for the Barrier Conquista, but of course for the entire universal struggle, right? It was a sole Christendom. Uh, that was the Imperial Catholic tradition. There was no um, escape from it, and uh, this was also a chance, in fact, for all these orders to internationalize to some extent. You know, uh, after the, the trial against the Templars and their the solution in France were many, um, let's say, Templars offshoots in encounters, like especially the Barren Peninsula, where some of the Templars had escaped. In the meanwhile, and vice versa, you see here some Iberian orders are subsumed also by the broader external ones, were not properly of, of, of Iberia. You have uh, the Order of San Julian del Pereiro Alcantara which um, was uh, originating in Leon, was subsumed by the crown in 1494. We have Montfragu uh, from Castille starting in 1196 and absorbed by the one of Calatrava in 1221. 
we said before of San Jorge de Alfama found in 1201 in the crown of Aragon and uh, or absorbed by the order of Montesa uh, at the beginning of the 15th century. And speaking of the latter, Montesa was an order actually much more recently uh, appeared, founded in 1321, became known as the one of Our Lady of Montesa and St. George of Alfama, uh, essentially amalgamated uh, with it in 1400. The, the, the order's habit was a red cross adopted in place of the black one that up to that point had been used, all right? while well, the habit was white. We have this nice uh, variations. Plus, there was the Order of the Knights of Christ, founded in 1318, which was one of, uh, said before, like the offshoots of the Templar Order. As it was the Order of Montesa, hence the late foundation in the early 14th century, right? because this were following, here you see, 1318, 1321, the dissolution of, of the temple in the main uh, French uh, uh, establishment. And uh, the the bench of the Knights of Christ was a red cross with a white twist in the middle, though. The habit was white as well. So you have all this, as you understand, also pretty complicated and difficult to remember uh, information, which you don't have to be probably too harsh about if you really forget at some point. But... Right, getting cultured about these um, orders, understanding where they were coming from, where they were going, why they chose the symbols, like what was there evident that they could perceive there was a, a common matrix. Here the, you, you understand that in spite of the divisions within the Iberian Peninsula, and they were in part also mirrored by these um, different orders so scattered but also as we've seen founded like the, there is the say Santiago in in Spain and of course also the Portuguese uh, affirmed that the, their own uh, order of Santiago that they were all cousins but were not brothers actually that would be made them brethren like but the, at least among orders I mean within that Iberian world and preserving important characteristics uh, on their own, um, including the one of being very, very tied to the mere uh, to the very existence of the same Iberian monarchies that had themselves been molded into their conquest, had been born within that right. And the Christian identity here in the has a specific Spanish source in which it sort of manifest itself, which is very militarized, is very driven in this constant sacrifice and activity. And that, of course, gets pretty messy as, as say, the reason why the Moors remained established until 1492 is not just that Granada was difficult to um, to storm, to, 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 to capture, but uh, the, the fact that they, the, after Las Navas, and so the the establishment mostly of this tripartite order. It was also the, the Kingdom of Navarre in the north uh, eastern corner. Uh, not quite a corner, well, it's at least the corner of, if you look at the crown of Castile. You know. um, this order that was actually controlling a vast amount of territories, uh, in some cases also overseas, and that were constantly quarreling with one another. Uh, we've seen it uh, also in the video again about the Spanish and Portuguese military organization because of the different sides that these monarchies take in the Hundred Years' War. Um, their navies were becoming ever more relevant in that struggle, but they were properly local uh, efforts of uh, military reorganization. And uh, the military orders were arguably sort of a more archaic relic of the past, but the Iberia could have not done without them. Um, and they were still actual for the local needs and still, you know, functional and alive with their spirit, with their tradition that 
uh, are very interesting just to follow in historical perspective and we will definitely look better at them mostly encountering them in battle videos because there is always that elite element that does something they distinguish themselves right they are again designed that their purpose their reason that is to outperform anybody right and to set the example being really the uh, the finest troops available for the glory of Christendom that also did bring to victory in the Spanish uh, in the Spanish case and um, therefore would remain an enormous motive of prestige and, and glory and fame for, for the same country in its uh, medieval past and more uh, I make this videos about the military dress because I think that they are uh, they are interesting. They habituate you to consider the different phase of the Middle Ages. How, let's say, differences matter, right? It's not um, even in in what uh, we understand as homogeneous systems. Like the traditional world always tells you that there is a difference between people. Right? There is not such a thing like a real homogeneity. There is always like a degree of sin, a degree of fault that requires a differentiation that uh, is hopefully, in fact, going towards the right direction, towards the positive endeavor, towards the collective effort for the common cause. Uh, and that has, in this case, like uh, the, the form properly of a, of a military commitment, um, a religious one and that also however heavily interferes in politics and uh, the, these orders were seeing themselves a bit like those same oligarchic houses that they were part of the, the, their members were coming from um, and of course making part of their politics that the royal one taking sides and during civil wars um, being that uh, take, doing pretty much what they were trained to do militarily speaking offering their calls to whom they thought naturally that were making the the better game, right? Not just for at least for purposes that it were to be religiously clothed as anything would be for obvious reasons of necessity. Like uh, there must be a right and a wrong, right? Anyway, uh, but we're also corresponding to the very interesting intersections that these orders had uh, with the, the various nobility houses as well. That's actually one of the most interesting aspects of them. I, again, I don't know how often we will talk about the monastic military orders, at least in depth, um, because I still have to make a video actually um, addressing that, um, let's say that level of, like, let's let's look just at this order, like let's make it two hours and a half long video on say the order of Alcantara or Avids, right? That would be fantastic and, and, and mind-blowing. Um, however, uh, again, uh, it takes a bit of um, bit of work and hard work and uh, especially one that uh, must take in consideration lots of other um, lots of other say background because um, you don't just go by um, you don't just go by okay let's talk about the monastic military orders and that's it right here I have well I have a playlist of nine videos ten with this one so far yeah it's something it's something and I'm fairly satisfied to get I see it people watch them strangely enough because um, as you understand I don't ad end up saying too much in these videos because they're almost the didascalic when you get down to the information but I try to clothe them a little bit like to add a bit of pope in this broader perspective and context that can help in fact approaching the, the topic as well um, we'll hopefully have keeping having fun uh, about them uh, I'm glad we, we touched on this topic 
Yeah, and for today, however, I uh, stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.